when they both contracted a fever, which turned out to be typhoid, and they were forced to move back to the city to recuperate and find lodging for the hot summer months in some place where they wouldn't have to sleep on the ground floor. So it was that the little house on Bridge Street, where Hudson had lived for a time as a bachelor, became a real home. Downstairs, the chapel and guest hall remained the same, and the Chinese Christians and inquirers came and went freely. But upstairs, the barn-like attic was transformed into cheery little rooms whose curtained windows looking out on the narrow street in front and the canal behind. Marie Taylor, having lived in that neighborhood for five years, had friends everywhere among the people. Hudson soon realized what an advantage it was to their ministry that women and children could now be evangelized along with the men. And since all the world loves a lover, the obvious affection and warmth evidenced by this young couple attracted old and new friends alike to the fellowship of their home. One of their dearest friends and helpers was an ex-Buddhist leader, a cotton merchant named Mr. Ni. Nee. He had lived in Ningpo many years and was a deeply religious man. He spent much of his time and money in service to the gods, yet he was satisfied by the religions he studied and taught to others. Then, passing an open door on the street one evening, he heard a bell being rung and saw people assembling as if for a meeting. Learning that it was a hall for the discussion of religious matters, he too went in. Leading the meeting was a young foreigner in Chinese dress, preaching from his sacred classics. The young man seemed at home in the Ningpo dialect, and Mr. Ni could understand every word of the passage he read. But what was its meaning? Quote, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man men be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. End quote. <clears throat> Mr. Nee was both puzzled and moved by what he heard. Saved, not condemned? A way to find everlasting life? A God who loved the world? The meeting came to a close. The foreign teacher ceased speaking. And with the instinct of one accustomed to lead in such matters, Nee rose in his place, looking around at the audience, and said simply, I have long sought the truth, but without finding it. I have traveled far and near, but have never searched it out. In Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, I have found no rest. But I do find rest in what we have heard tonight. Henceforth, I am a believer in Jesus. This new believer became an ardent student of the Bible. The rapid spiritual growth which resulted was a great encouragement to the tailors. Not long after his conversion, he obtained permission to address a meeting of the religious society over which he had formerly presided. Hudson accompanied Mr. Nee on this occasion and was deeply impressed by the clarity and the conviction with which he preached. And when one of his former followers was led to Christ through his testimony, Hudson shared Mr. Nee's excitement of becoming a soul winner. One day, while talking with his missionary friend, Mr. Nee raised the question, How long have you had the glad tidings in your country? Some hundreds of years, Hudson replied. What? Hundreds of years? My father sought the truth. He continually, sadly, and died without finding it. Oh, why did you not come sooner? It was a painful moment which Hudson Taylor would never forget. And he deepened his sense of calling. There was so much work to be done. He must still take the message of Christ into the interior of China, where millions and millions still died every year without having heard the good news. It was easy for Hudson to grow impatient with the work. What he really needed was more help. He was tempted by the prospect of hiring some of the new Chinese Christians to assist him full time. Already Mr. Ni nee was eagerly devoting all the time he could spare from his business. So were others from the growing band of converts. Ning Ki, the basket maker, Wang, the farmer of Hossi, and Tussie, the teacher. Though they and others were all occupied in their necessary vocations through the day, they often came to the mission house in the evening and spent much time there on Sundays. It would have been easy to employ the Christian teacher in the school to which Maria Taylor was giving many hours daily, or to take on others at a modest salary to train them for positions of usefulness. But the Taylors decided that doing so, while it might prove a short-term help, could well be a hindrance to their goals in the long run. To pay young converts, however sincere, for making known the gospel, and to pay them with money from foreign sources, would surely weaken their influence in the community 
and perhaps also weaken their Christian character. How were the converts ever to know the joy of unpaid voluntary service, service out of love for the Lord, unless the missionaries could be patient and wait for their spiritual development? So Hudson and Maria hoped and prayed that the time would soon come when the call of God into Christian service would become obvious to some of the Chinese Christians, and that when it happened, the other Chinese Christians would themselves be ready and willing to support them. How is China to be evangelized but by the Chinese church? In the meantime, the workload for the young missionaries became a never-ending challenge. Life was full and overflowing with both responsibilities and opportunities. Hudson himself did quite a bit of medical practice, as well as regular preaching in the streets and in the chapel, receiving visitors, attending to correspondence and accounts, and continuing evangelistic excursions into the surrounding countryside. But none of those duties were allowed to interfere with what had become his chief task, the daily shepherding of his small but growing flock. After the regular public meeting every evening, three separate periods were devoted to carefully prepared study. To begin, Hudson would teach a lesson from the Old Testament. Then, after a time, a chapter was read from Pilgrim's Progress or some other helpful Christian book. And finally, a passage of the New Testament would be discussed and applied to daily life. This regular, nightly schedule for the small band of Chinese believers led up to Sunday with its special services for worship and for reaching outsiders. Sunday had its times of teaching, too. For Hudson Taylor and his colleagues knew that it cost the Chinese Christians dearly to close up shop and store on the first day of the week, and they wanted to make the most of the time and sacrifice of the new converts. So, between the regular services, Christians, inquirers, patients, school children, and servants were divided into classes and taught according to their particular needs. This made Sunday a heavy day for the missionaries, for there were only four of them, the Taylors and the Joneses, to share the great load. But there was something unmistakable, almost tangible about, bold about their spirit of service and love for the people. It drew more and more people to the Bridge Street Fellowship. Those who came brought others who also sensed the difference in that place, a difference one new visitor recognized when he asked the friend who had brought him, Why does my heart feel so much wider when I come into these doors? Perhaps it was because the tailor's own hearts were as wide open as the doors of their mission to the people around them. For their ministry grew, and the promise of an even greater ministry grew with it. The Treaty of Tinsin, signed in the summer after Hudson and Maria's marriage, opened the way at last to all of the inland provinces. Foreigners now had the right to travel freely under the protection of passports. Inland China, which Hudson had prayed for for so long, was now within reach, and yet more patience was required. He wrote home in November, You will have heard before this all about the new treaty. We may be losing some of our Ningpo missionaries, who will go inland. And, oh, will not the church at home awaken and send us out more to publish the glad tidings? Many of us long to go. And how we long to go. But there are duties and ties that bind us that none but the Lord can unloose. May he give gifts to many of the native Christians, qualifying them for the care of the churches already formed, and thus set us free for pioneering work. As anxious as Hudson and Maria both were to take the message of Christ to the interior, they each felt a prior commitment to the care and nurture of the small band of Ningpo Christians at Bridge Street. Leaving them now, even for the good of others, would have been like a parent abandoning their children in the wilderness. Later years proved the wisdom of this decision. Many of these same poor and unlearned Chinese Christians were to become leaders and evangelists among their own people and provided invaluable service to Hudson Taylor in his life's work. But at this time, the tailor's excitement over the spiritual and numerical growth of their little band of believers was mixed with an impatience to fulfill their greater calling to the vast reaches of inland China. Despite the open door to the interior and the changing tides of the ongoing war, perhaps in part because of these factors, the widespread attitude toward foreigners remained hostile. The outrages of the coolie trade had spread northward and antagonized many people around Ningpo who heard tales of devil foreigners kidnapping men and boys and shipping them off to far-off lands, never to be seen again. And while neighbors and friends might quickly come to the defense of the tailors, the missionaries lived constantly with the threat that some rabble-rouser might one day incite a riot crowd to take vengeance on any Europeans to be found. It had happened before in other cities, and given the underlying mood of the country, was almost certain to happen again. While there wasn't much they could do for protection, the tailors did keep a boat moored on the ca canal at the back door of their house, 
and the rope was kept term- firmly tied by their bedroom window and that would allow them to escape to the canal under cover of darkness if necessary. Such was the political situation during the second summer after Hudson and Maria were married when after nine long months of expected waiting, their first child was born. They named her Grace. The thermometer read 104 degrees in the coolest part of the house on July 31, 1859, the day that the little one was born. And only once in the week that followed did the temperature drop below 88 degrees. That was at midnight during a thunderstorm. The political climate remained just as hot. Surging crowds around the mission house had almost rioted a few days before. Cries of, beat the foreigners, and kill the foreign devils, filled the air. No one had been beaten down, had beaten down the doors as easy as that would have been. Despite the continuing sense of danger, fear wasn't the feeling expressed in Hudson's next letter to home. Instead, he wrote, My dear parents, though this is the Lord's day, I find myself able to pen a few lines which will no doubt surprise you as much as it does myself. The reason is that I am at home taking care of my wife and baby girl, your first grandchild. Oh, my dear parents, God has been so good to me, to us all, better far than my fears. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Though it was still some time before the period of dangerous unrest finally passed, the Taylors' joy over their new baby brought a wondrous new feeling of family into their lives. Yet, even in this time of personal joy, there came a sad and unexpected occurrence which added greatly to Hudson Taylor's responsibilities and rooted him still deeper in his ministry at Ningpo. Hudson's former colleague, Dr. Dr. Parker, had recently completed construction of his new hospital. Located strategically near one of the city gates overlooking the river, its impressive buildings attracted the notice of thousands daily. For the good doctor who had suffered with Hudson through their difficult beginnings in China, It was the wonderful culmination of years of patient work. The hospital, built to accommodate the needs of the foreign community as well as the doctor's Chinese practice, promised to be the foundation of the Parker's ministry for years to come. But suddenly the doctor's wife was stricken with a fever. Within hours, she died, leaving her grief-stricken husband with the responsibility of caring for their four small children, one of them seriously ill. Dr. Parker saw no alternative but to take his children home to Scotland. But what was to be done about his hospital? The wards were full of patients and the dispensary was crowded day after day with a steady stream of people needing medical help. No other doctor was free to take his place, and yet to close down with winter coming was unthinkable. To complicate things even further, there was no surplus of funds he could leave to continue the work. Yet he couldn't bear to see all his years of hard work and preparation go to waste. Perhaps his young friend Hudson Taylor could carry on at least the dispensary portion of the work as a medical ministry to the local Chinese community. That was the proposition he laid before Hudson, who later recalled the experience. After waiting upon the Lord for guidance, I felt constrained to undertake not only the dispensary, but the hospital as well, relying solely on the faithfulness of a prayer-hearing God to furnish means for its support. At times, there were no fewer than 50 inpatients, besides a large number who attended the dispensary. Thirty beds were ordinarily allotted to free patients and their attendants, and about as many more to opium smokers who paid their board while being cured of the habit. As all the wants of the sick in the wards were supplied gratuitously, as well as the medical supplies needed for the outpatient department, the daily expenses were considerable. Hospital attendants also were required, involving their support. The funds for the maintenance of all this had previously been supplied by the doctor's foreign practice. With his departure, this source of income ceased. But had not God said that whatever we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus shall be done? And are we not told to seek first the kingdom of God, not means to advance it, and that all these things shall be added to us? Such promises were surely sufficient. Since resigning from the mission which had sent him to China, Hudson had many opportunities to exercise that faith he had tried to build up during those years of preparation back in England, days which now seemed a lifetime ago and worlds away. And he was learning that God was just as faithful in China as he had been in England, where half a sovereign arrived in the mail the morning after Hudson had given his last coin to a starving family, and where Dr. Hardy's wealthy patient just happened to drop by to pay his bill at 10 o'clock at night in cash. Just one illustration of God's earlier faithfulness needs to be told here. Back when Hudson had been preparing to move from Shanghai to Swatow,